Hello, everyone. I am on We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. I'm Suzanne Wunz. I'm the executive director for the Harvard Law School Library. And on behalf of the library, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming to today's book talk on the first global prosecutor, Promise and Constraints. And our panelists today are the three editors of the book. We have Dean Martha Minow, the Morgan and Helen Chu Dean and Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Professor C. Cora Trufost, Assistant Professor of Law at Syracuse University College of Law, and also formerly a Clemenco Fellow here at HLS. And Professor Alex Whiting, Professor of Practice at Harvard Law School. And just before we get started, I want to mention very quickly that the session today is being taped. So at the end, when we have questions and answers, if you ask a question, that will be part of the recording. Um, and without further, oh wait, sorry, one last quick announcement. Uh, the coop is over here by the food table, and they are selling copies of the book as well. So afterwards, you can purchase a copy and maybe even snag a signature from one of the editors. And, and without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Whiting. You can put, purchase multiple copies. <laughs> um, I'm sure, you know, they make great holiday gifts. Um, so I am uh, I'm just going to start us off by um, showing, if I can get the technical part of this cr right, uh, a few clips um, from a movie called The Prosecutor. Uh, and it's about uh, the first prosecutor of the court, Luis Moreno Ocampo, and his office. And we selected a few clips, three sh very short clips of the prosecutor uh, talking about different aspects of the court, uh, about his role, about the function, some of the challenges of the court. And it kind of, we chose them because it's, the book is about the prosecutor, and here we have the prosecutor speaking himself. Uh, and it kind of tees up some of the issues that we'll be talking about. And then we'll each make a few uh, really brief remarks, uh, and then we will open it up for questions. So um, be ready with your questions, because we'll leave plenty of time for questions. OK, so let me see if I can do this. Hang on. Oops. I'll get there. I use a Mac, so I don't know how to do this. Hang on, hang on, I'll get there. Can you, can you help me? Yeah, I did, but then I did Control F. No, you come up here. For centuries, humanity was trying to stop crimes through negotiations. But it's not working. Hitler could not be a piece than many others. That's why there was a new idea, the law as a limit, the law as a way to put limits in the, in the negotiation table. You need negotiation, but those who commit massive crimes go to jail. <laughs> A national prosecutor would just get his local police to make an arrest. But of course, Moreno Campo doesn't have that power. He needs the help of sovereign states, and they aren't used to yielding control. Can we go? I don't know. Uh, I think it's the red light. Breaking the law. The prosecutor breaking the law. <laughs> that is the difference between me as an international prosecutor and a normal prosecutor. I had to build the state around me. And that is new and it's interesting and it's complicated and it's crazy. But it's my job. If, if you build the state around you, it's kind of like a world state. No, that's the point. I had to build that the national state support me as a normal issue, in the same way that in Canada, the Ontario chief of police will help the federal prosecutor in a normal case. So that's it. It's not, it will be normal in Canada. I have to be normal in the world. The 
nothing like when we persecute the other community, no, when we persecute them. That's why, yes, we had our impartiality is not appreciated by them. No, it's like a, in a football match, the referee has no fan. It's alone. They need the referee, but no one is supporting the referee. Yeah, and, and, and justice for the person who's hurt me. Yeah, yeah. No one justice for the people. Yeah. Of course, justice, justice for my enemies. Yeah. That's, yes. I think the important for me is everyone accept and impunity is important. Everyone accept the framework. Different groups discuss different aspects. Discuss why this charge, why this incident, why the Ugandans are not here, why Rwanda not here, different aspects. But in terms of establishing the law, that is something established here. The people understand, the court has to put it. Okay, now um, Dean Minow, please. So life is filled with funny and uh, twisting turns if you're open to it. I was invited in 2009 to participate in a conference, a PrepCom, a conference to assist the people setting up the brand new International Criminal Court, the first permanent court to deal with crimes against humanity and war crimes. So I went and I talked, and I met someone who had been selected to become the very first prosecutor, Luis Marino Ocampo. Actually, I knew him already because he had taught here. But we started talking about what could we do to actually help this fledgling court and its mission of spreading the ideals and the practices of uh, accountability to prevent impunity. <coughs> and I said, well, <coughs> there's one thing I know how to do, which is I can teach. I'll teach a class. And then a month later, I was made dean. <laughs> so Louis said, I'll understand if you don't want to teach the class. I said, no, but now you have to teach it for sure with me. And then I recruited Alex Whiting, and then I recruited Cora Trufost. And for three years, we taught a course with the prosecutor, with Luis Marino Ocampo, uh, which we organized, we called it a lab. We organized it as a way for him to get away from The Hague, where the court is situated, and reflect on the work he had undertaken, and I'll describe a little bit about that work, and engage students from around the world in giving feedback about policies that he was developing. So we did that for three years, and in the course of doing that, thought about what else could we do to uh, investigate, explore, critique the project, and that was the origin of this book. So for people who don't know, the uh, International Criminal Court um, is the first permanent court of its kind. It's the uh, product of a treaty process. The Rome Statute uh, is, the, is a treaty that established uh, this institution, and it entered into force in 2002 when it was ratified by 60 countries. It's currently ratified by 123 countries. And of course, the court is not an only new, the prosecutor's office is brand new. And as the first prosecutor with a global jurisdiction, uh, Luis uh, and anyone in that role since have said, well, so what do I do? What's the law? What's the process? Do we have plea bargains? Do we have uh, rules about uh, lawyers talking with witnesses? How do we set this up? Uh, and uh, it, this volume of essays is the first sustained effort to examine that office and the response to those fundamental questions. The contributors range from legal scholars, scholars of international relations, to practitioners of international law, including uh, Pat Wald, a judge on the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, uh, David Sheffer, the former US ambassador at large for war crimes, others who have had roles in international institutions. We wanted to have a global look. Uh, the Court, just to be clear, is an independent organization. It is not part of the United Nations. It is uh, set up to be permanent, unlike the ad hoc tribunals for the uh, uh, former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. Uh, its jurisdiction was prospective from the time that it was created, not retrospective. The United States is not a party. Um, the Office of the Prosecutor is responsible for receiving referrals from nation states or even other groups and from the UN Security Council uh, and pursues investigations of any crimes within its jurisdiction. And it faces tough questions, like what if there's an ongoing conflict? 
Does the court proceed as if there's no ongoing conflict? Does the court have a role in brokering peace? Does the court have any kind of way to actually execute its authority? The prosecutor's office in particular has very little power. And I'm gonna end with just this general theme. As we talked over the course of the time of the course and in with the authors and of course with Luis Marino Ocampo who wrote the long and thoughtful introduction to this book, the limits on the prosecutor's office and on the court itself were overwhelming. For example, there's no subpoena power, there's no arrest power, there's no ability as we have in domestic prosecutorial offices to actually secure the evidence. And what we explored in the book was how, if at all, could those limitations be turned into strengths? How does the dependence of the office of the prosecutor on collaboration with the member states provide an opportunity to disseminate the ideals of the rule of law and accountability to, uh, in response to terrible, terrible crimes and to share that responsibility? Uh, and to actually make it possible that this court that can only hear a few cases at a time is really at the top of a pyramid of domestic responses and domestic efforts to prevent mass atrocity. My amazing co-editors, I think uh, you know Alex Whiting, uh, who was not only a prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, but in the midst of this course actually said, well, could I go to the ICC? And he did, and he became the investigations coordinator at first and then the prosecutions coordinator. And so to have as our co-editor of this book somebody who was in The Hague, who saw it all, uh, was incredibly invaluable. And Cora Trufost, uh, whose scholarship at the intersection of international relations and international law brought not only that academic perspective invaluably, but also her own on the ground work. She worked at the International uh, Criminal uh, Law Tribunal in East Timor in Sierra Leone. She led the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace, and Security at the UN. And so it's just been an un unbelievable delight and honor for me to work with these two amazing people. Uh, well, thank you, Dean. Um, so I just want to pick up on a few of the themes that, themes that the dean uh, introduced, um, and in particular, the, the, the idea that this course was a lab. Um, and it was a lab in sort of two senses. First, we pulled in a lot of other professors from uh, the law school and beyond who do all kinds of work, negotiation, national security work. Um, and, and then the other thing was that there was really a dynamic interaction with the prosecutor in the court, and he really did bring his uh, policies that he was formulating and developing and um, kind of tried them out, shopped them in the lab, got our, got our feedback on them. Uh, and in fact, the book was originally uh, conceived as commentary on the policies, and it evolved later into the, into the book of essays. Um, there was this one interesting th moment that kind of captured how the lab worked. Um, there was a day when the, the, the dean, we were, we were having a discussion, the dean said, oh, this reminds me of this article that Bob Mnookin wrote um, back, I think, in the 70s, um, which is called Bargaining in the Shadow of the Law, the Case of Divorce. And she said, you know, the, the, the International criminal, criminal Court is a small institution, but really what's important is the shadow that the court casts and how actors, whether diplomats or military officials or political leaders, will have to operate uh, in the shadow of the court. And that's where the force of the court will be. Well, the prosecutor loved this. Of course, the prosecutor loved everything that the dean said, right? <laughs> Hung on her every word. <laughs> Marta, I love that. And, um, <laughs> So he started using that, he started using that in his speeches, the shadow of the ICC, right? Um, and then the Secretary General of the UN picked up on it, and it's, he started to use it in his speeches when talking about the International Criminal Court. Now the new prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda, quotes the Secretary General using it in his speeches. Um, and there are a number of commentators, if you Google shadow of the ICC, you'll see a number of articles, Kenya, the shadow of the ICC, Colombia, the shadow of the ICC, everybody's picking it up. And it started in our lab, right? <laughs> um, and it's a perfect, it was actually, it's, it, it's not just an interesting sort of synergy, but it was a, it's a perfect metaphor 
because as the dean said, the court is small and it will, only it will do only a few cases a year. In fact, the court just published a document called its ba basic size document, which it very forthrightly said it will only do a f prosecute a few cases from each conflict where hundreds or thousands of people could be prosecuted, they will only do a few. So its force is not just in the cases it will do, but in the way it will influence other actors and the way it engages with other actors. And at the court, we always talked about, you know, people look at the court as this big thing and this like amaze, the, the, the ultimate destination, but the prosecutor would always say it's not about the court, it's about the Rome system. The court is just part of a system, a larger system of domestic courts that have the, have the first obligation to prosecute these cases and political, military actors, diplomats, and so forth. So it sits at the, at the at, at, I don't know if I even want to say the center, um, but within a larger system. And the book, I think, captures that. I think the, the book has a number of chapters um, uh, that discuss how the court engages with other actors. Um, Cora's chapter about the court's engagement with the Security Council, the Dean's chapter about how the court educates uh, beyond. There's a chapter about the court and universal jurisdiction. Um, and Bob Mnookin, the, the, uh, the unwitting author of the, of the term, The Shadow of the Court, um, uh, uh, contributed a chapter about um, the, the court and peace negotiations and a, new a kind of new spin on the peace versus justice debate. So uh, I just wanted to, to for take two more minutes to talk about what, what so, so that's the system. What is the court's role in that system? And um, the clips, I think, are interesting because they captured a little bit of the prosecutor's thinking about how the court should, what the court's role, what, role is, what it should try to accomplish. And, the, and, it, and I, I, I saw sort of two objectives under the prosecutor that are, were a little bit in tension with each other. Uh, the first is, really establishing the importance of the law, the rule of law. And this was, uh, th this was why the prosecutor, and, and he talks about that, how in that clip where he's walking from the court at night and he breaks the law and he says, he says you know, I wanna make the law and the functioning of the law as normal as, as functioning in a domestic system. And that's why he wanted to publish policies and be transparent. And he knew that the legitimacy of the court depended on the court being following the law, being perceived as being a legal institution and not a political institution, um, and being transparent about that and being a responsible prosecutor. And, and I think one of the more interesting chapters in the book is by David Sheffer, who was the U.S. War Crimes Ambassador when the court, when, uh, dur when the court was negotiated in Rome in 1998. Um, and he talked about how the United States was concerned about a political prosecutor, and that's a large part of the reason why the the U.S. did not join the court uh, in, in 2002 and still has not joined. But David Sheffer said, look, the record of the court and the record of the first prosecutor, the record of the first uh, 13 years um, shows otherwise, that the court is not a, acting as a political institution, that is acting as a legal institution. Um, the states that interact with the court act as political actors, um, but the court itself acts as a legal institution. Um, the second thing that the, the second objective of the prosecutor, which at times felt like it could be a little bit in tension, is that the prosecutor wanted to have an impact. Thought it was important that the court be relevant. So it had to follow the law, but it also had to be relevant. And that is complicated because the court is a legal institution but operates in a political environment. And the thing about the political environment is that politics changes very quickly. Um, some of the early cases, the prosecutor took a long time to investigate the cases and would bring arrest warrants and charges years after the investigation began. The Sudan case, for example, uh, start, the investigation started in 2005 and the, and the prosecutor brought charges in 2007. What he discovered is that by the time he was bringing charges, the world had kind of moved on. Uh, and so he would issue arrest warrants and nothing would happen. Um, and so in his later years, he tried to start to move more quickly to have uh, a bigger impact. Um, and so I, I was at the court uh, as the investigations coordinator when we got the referral of the Libya case uh, in, at the end of February of 2011. 
And I, I remember very clearly the meeting that we had the day, two days after we got the referral. We were just re very, very excited at the court because it, it was a unanimous Security Council referral. The world, you know, we, the, the world was paying attention. It, it, we were on the on the on the you know the front pages on the stage. We had we literally had countries calling us and saying how can we help, um, and the prosecutor said I remember he said very clearly at this first meeting he said this will not last, this support will not last, and he said we have to move very quickly and we did. He said I want I want an arrest warrant in three weeks. I said no way that's never gonna be three. Weeks. It took three months, but even that is very quick. Um, but the challenge of moving quickly is that cases uh, are not always, y y it's hard to put together a case in three months. And the cases you, you, can, you can, we put together an, an, enough to get an arrest warrant, but the, the cases that are put together quickly uh, have other challenges. So the prosecutor had to kind of navigate these two different objectives. The court has since swung, under the new prosecutor, swung to a policy of taking more time in building the cases, I, I think that will be serve the objective well of being cautious and a, a lawful institution, but whether it will be able to be relevant and timely with that approach is a, is a question that we'll have to see. Thanks, Alex. Um, so the sort of constraints and power that we've sketched out so far might be at their most challenging for the prosecutor in terms of his relationship with the UN Security Council. Because the U UN Security Council, as everyone here uh, I'm sure is aware, is a political body that has, makes decisions based on the state party's desires, political desires, and accordingly operates under the vicissitudes of politics. It's not consistent, and um, while it has that strong power, that it can follow through and enforce some decisions, um, it is not always willing to do that when it acts. And yet, imagine that in April 2003, um, you are the new prosecutor, you're appointed the new prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, and among your many tasks, the tasks that um, Dean Minow has mentioned and that Alex just mentioned about structuring your um, office and your relationships with your member states, you also have to decide how to manage your relationship with one of the most powerful bodies in the world, the United Nations Security Council. And um, both of my fellow panelists have alluded to the fact that the ICC is an autonomous body, but it's also placed in relationship to the United Nations Security Council by the terms of the Rome Statute. Specifically, the Security Council has the power to refer a matter to the ICC. So, and that, that could be, if you think about the cases of Libya and Sudan, the two cases where the Security Council did refer matters to the court, those could be non-state parties to the Rome Statute. So those are, par those are states that, are, that have evinced through their unwillingness to sign the Rome Statute a uh, desire not to cooperate with the terms of the Rome Statute, you could say. So the Security Council has the power under the Rome Statute to send non-state parties before the ICC, and it's done that twice before, in the case of, the, of Libya, 1970, Resolution 1970, and in the case of the Sudan in 2005. Um, and it is in those circumstances where the prosecutor's power is at its smallest at some level. His power to command investigatory authority within the nation state is extremely constrained by the fact that this is a very unwilling party before the court. Um, and yet, that's what Luis Moreno Ocampo had to decide to do, or had to figure out what to do about, is how is he going to interact with the UN Security Council? They have the power to refer matters. Under Article um, 16, they have the power to defer ongoing ICC proceedings. They can, if they agree and they don't use their veto power, they can halt ongoing ICC proceedings. Um, and they can seek review by the pretrial chamber of a decision of the prosecutors not to proceed. So although they are in name autonomous, they do, or they're separate entities, the Security Council could have a pretty significant effect on the prosecutor's plans otherwise. Um, so within these constraints, he 
I see that he had sort of two bright line choices on opposite ends of the spectrum. One was to treat himself as an agent of the council. Um, and in so doing, he would have been consistent with what some scholars have said, which is that if the Security Council sends you a case, you have to follow up on it. You're acting as a security court. Um, so uh, Jens Olin and George Fletcher have argued that the prosecutor has a duty to investigate and to follow up on Security Council referrals. So he could have sort of just treated himself as an agent of the council. Okay, you've sent me these, these matters and I'm going to proceed um, immediately. Or he might have tried to please some of his, um, some of the growing controversy over the course of his term uh, by African states by trying to distance himself somewhat from the authority of the Security Council, uh, maybe even uh, acting somewhat aggressively to the Security Council. But he did neither. He really chose to craft himself as an institutional ally of the Council while also trying to maintain his independence, which is a tremendous, a tremendously difficult balancing act. Um, but he did that by, um, when he received his first referral, he wrote a letter that was not very, um, it wasn't very much noticed in the literature, but he wrote a letter that said that after reviewing the facts of the referral, he had decided there was basis to proceed with an investigation. So he was implicitly reserving for himself the authority not to proceed with an investigation when he received a Security Council referral. And this was consistent with his his claim and what you heard in the film clips that his duty is to follow the limits of the law. He is just applying the law. He is looking at the terms of the Rome Statute. He's applying them to the facts of this case, even if the case, the situation rather, is a politically sensitive one that the Security Council thinks is of utmost priority. He is going to take his time and analyze it legally and look to see whether there's jurisdiction. Um, so that was one way that he tried to preserve his independence. And he also at the same time, tried to, he treated the council as an ally in that even when the council, after referring these two hot potatoes to the court, and at some level vindicating or validating the court's existence through these referrals, um, did, not, did not send resources with those referrals. So the, the council said, ICC, here's the case of Sudan. We, we want help from you, but P.S., we're not giving you any resources. Uh, and we restrict the General Assembly from providing you with any funding or resources. So good luck. Um, and we know that you need to form collaborations among states, and you don't have enforcement power on your own, but good luck pursuing this matter in the Sudan. Um, under those circumstances, the prosecutor might have challenged the Security Council and might have tried to shame the members of the Security Council in his biennial reviews because after he receives a referral, he reports to the Security Council every six months. Um, so he might have come into the Security Council and said, hey, you've given me this case, but you've not given me any resources. I demand accountability, but he didn't do that. He was concerned with the long-term health of the institution, and he tried to finesse this relationship with the council by reporting what he was doing and sort of softly beseeching them for help, but not, not demanding their help or their accountability. That, that has changed now with the second prosecutor to some degree. In December of 2014, Fatou Benzouda, I don't know if we've talked about this, but no, when she, when she um, was making her biannual report on the Sudan to the Security Council, she announced, and I don't know if anyone in this room heard about this, it made the, it made the waves on the sort of geeky international criminal law blogs, but um, some of you have heard of it, I think, yeah, right. <laughs> but so she announced that she was freezing the, her work on the Sudan case. She basically tried to call the Security Council's bluff. She said, look, this, you know, we got this case in 2005, nothing's been happening, Bashir's been moved, she didn't say this out, she didn't say this explicitly. What she said was, I am going to, due to inaction, I am going to freeze my investigations and um, not proceed with the Sudan matter, basically, and tried to call the council's bluff. And what has transpired in the time following that is that in June, 
she backpedaled and she clarified her remarks by saying that what she really meant was that she was going to be devoting more resources to other matters, but of course she was still proceeding with the Sudan investigations. So the second prosecutor's attempt to call the council's bluff uh, was not successful and um, well, I guess I don't want to be that conclusory. Um, <laughs> it, it did not have the effect of having the Security Council follow up with action. Um, but the first prosecutor tried to maintain this institutional alliance with the council while at the same time keeping a sort of independence and impartiality and this idea that his was a legal institution that was not going to be governed by the political framework of the council. And so it's in the case of the relationship between the prosecutor and the security council, I think, that the ability of the court to cast a shadow is strained at its max because that shadow that's coming from the law being cast over the security council um, is, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult fit to try to coerce or to try to um, cajole any kind of result from the Security Council. Uh, but I, but there's some evidence that Moreno Campos' strategy of preserving this institutional alliance while at the same time maintaining his independence did contribute to a, an engagement with the Council and a sort of working relationship and has cast a little shadow on the Security Council, is what I'll say in closing. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to open up for questions. I'm just going to flag some topics that you might find of interest. Again, with this uh, theme of the powers of the weak, one of the things that uh, the first prosecutor tried to do was to write policies around areas even before there were any cases or investigations, and including how to work with... Uh, uh, witnesses, uh, how to develop a gender and sexual uh, violence policy, um, how to uh, work with NGOs, non-governmental organizations, when uh, nation states don't participate. Um, and uh, some of the activities also of this prosecutor that weren't formalized into policies, but I think are really interesting ways to deal with the powers of the weak, were um, also to work with the media. So the video excerpts that you saw are just examples from, was it three documentary films that were made with the cooperation of the court? Um, and uh, Luis Marino Ocampo's uh, effort to try to bring as many resources as possible included public relations. Uh, and, and public education becomes the chapter of my, uh, the subject of my chapter for a similar reason. Uh, when we wrote this book, when we edited, when we worked with our collaborators, we said, we don't know if this court's going to succeed. We don't know if it's going to exist. Uh, the project really asked the question, you're the first prosecutor, what can you possibly do to secure this effort? How can you institutionalize any of the steps that you take beyond your limited term? And that's a question that no one had asked before, and I think that um, uh, the, the chapters are really illuminating, but now we look forward to your questions. And should you institutionalize? And should you institutionalize? Really good question. You may have been following the Bashir case, the Sudan case. You know, Bashir, we had hoped, would be ostracized, having been uh, charged uh, with a call for arrest by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. We thought that would chill his travel. To the contrary, he's traveling widely, recently to South Africa. No one arrested him. Um, also to Security Council member states, China. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so, and, and that's exactly right. And so what would you do if you're a lawyer put in this kind of a role? This is uh, the first prosecutor successfully prosecuted the generals in uh, Argentina. He successfully prosecuted corporations for their corruption in Argentina. He's a crackerjack prosecutor given a role where he didn't have any of the tools that he was able to use before. So what would you do? Questions? Here's a mic coming for you. And let me, uh, as the mic comes, just say we're so grateful to the library for sponsoring this event. Why don't you identify yourself? Um, I'm Lydia Dude. I'm a former intern at the International Criminal Court under the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Uh, my question is regard, regards to the United Nations Security Council. 
Uh, I'm trying to think that uh, is it is it because of the accusation that the United Nations Security Council is only making referrals without resources that uh, is contributing to the fact that it has not made any referrals recently, or are there other factors that are at play? And also regarding the issue of uh, where the prosecutor was saying that is building states around the courts, uh, do you think that uh, it has become less of it has become like uh, states moving away from the court than states coming more towards the court. Thank you. Great, thanks. As regards the, the question about resources, um, so it is the Security Council making the referrals and since they've done that already without resources, one might argue they could continue to do that and they would if they could reach this sort of political agreement they need to send something to the ICC. And I think it's more the fact that they've not been able to agree politically on, for example, the situation in Syria that has led them to uh, inaction and not to refer matters to the ICC. That's not to say that they, uh, that Security Council members are, are satisfied with the way that the referrals they've sent already to the court have been handled. There's some grumbling amongst them, but I, I would argue that, that it would not prevent them from sending more hot potatoes to the ICC, because I've spent some time trying to think about the Security Council's motivations in sending, um, and, in sending matters to the court, and of course, it's a multi-body uh, um, organ, so there are 15 different states that have different motivations, but um, on the, it, as regards the three permanent members who are not members of the Rome Statute, Russia, China, and the United States, you could argue it's a win-win proposal for them to send cases to the court without resources because if the court succeeds in intervening and helps to allay some of the problems that are going on in the ground, helps to manage that threat to international peace and security, the Security Council has done its job. On the other hand, if they don't succeed, that's, uh, that's helpful to the states that aren't supportive of the court. So I think the lack of referral is more about political will than about resources. One small thought, uh, one of the things actually that Luis Marino Ocampo did is to go to non-members of the Security Council yeah. and to mobilize them and to educate them and to find ways that, again, the powers of the weak, the, the, the nation states that are not on the Security Council could have a voice. Right. And, that, and that's part of, um, in my chapter, one of the things I do is I document the, the Security Council's practice regarding the ICC over time. And you really note a shift in its perhaps unwitting, perhaps not deliberate embrace of the court. But over the course of time, um, they go from, the Security Council goes from, a, in the first five years, only having 2% of its, of its resolutions mention the International Criminal Court and those being negative mentions. Those were <laughs> attempts to defer the ICC's jurisdiction over peacekeepers. And then in the next five years or six years of Moreno Ocampo's term, 17% of the resolutions mention the International Criminal Court and start to incorporate the language of international criminal law norms in this institution into these resolutions, not in binding ways, but in other research that I've done, I've shown how this institutional practice of the council can sometimes ripen into enforcement mechanisms. So over time, perhaps there will be a kind of um, uh, accumulation of institutionalization there that will lead to more engagement with the ICC and maybe more resources. You had a second question, though. What was our second question? Yeah, let's go on. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's okay. go. Okay. There's, uh, where's this? Where's the mic? Call? Oh, here's, here's the mic. Is, the mic is coming. <laughs> I should say Phil Hyman was here a little while ago. He was incredibly helpful also to our lab and uh, as supporter and friend of Luis Marino Campo. Hi, I'm Marissa, I'm a 1L. Um, I have a question about thinking about conflicts that currently are not falling under the jurisdiction of the ICC and probably will not, like Syria, um, where you probably will see a kind of accountability mechanism set up eventually. Um, given how expensive those tribunals have tended to be and how they probably will draw on the brain power of people who are probably contributing now to work being done at the ICC, what 
What will that look like for future funding and functioning of the court in cooperation with mechanisms that will stand outside the court? Did you bring your crystal ball? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so um, it, it's an interesting question about whether the the court was designed to be the you know the permanent court and to 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 uh, adjudicate all cases coming from future conflicts from here on in so that we would no longer need to have ad hoc tribunals for each conflict, right? Um, but I think uh, more and more it's looking like there may still be room and need for ad hoc tribunals because at the margins uh, there may may not be an ability to agree that certain that certain cases will go to the court to the international criminal court. So I think in Syria, for example, it's more likely that um, that there will be an ad hoc tribunal for Syria than that the case will go to the ICC. As far as funding goes, I I mean the courts are expensive. Uh, the 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 budget of the international criminal court is a, is a hundred million dollars a year. Um, but uh, but honestly, in the scheme of things, in you know when you t you're talking about um, the cost of war and the cost of war crimes, um, I, 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 if the court has even a marginal, minuscule deterrence value, uh, if it deters just a few crimes going forward, it pays for itself. Um, so I'm 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 always sort of impatient with the cost. Uh, arguments because I, I I think yeah standing alone it seems expensive um, but uh, in comparison you know in the in the global budgets international budgets is it's a bargain. Let me say just a few things about this. One, the cost issue has been raised with every international criminal justice project. Why can't we spend, uh, actually? raise this money and rebuild the towns, rebuild the communities, build the electrical grid, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm, for all, I'm all for that. One thing I've learned, budgets don't work that way. You may have the ability to raise the money for one project. If you say no to that project, it doesn't mean that the money's gonna go to the thing you want it to. So that's one thing I'd say. Second, uh, I'd say is I, I'm a skeptic about the deterrent effect of this project. I have been a skeptic for a long time. Having said that, Samantha Power, our alum, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., um, she, she actually reported going to the Sudan and finding that members of the Jinjaweed, the uh, militia, are very concerned about their identities being known because they're worried about liability, criminal liability. This was, to me, a revelation that there would be people down on the ground trying to cover their faces, trying to cover their IDs, so there is a shadow. Uh, the third thing I'd say is I totally agree with Alex that I think that the International Criminal Court does not uh, preclude, prevent, uh, uh, interfere with the development of other tribunals. And here are reasons why I think it's a good thing. One is the development of hybrid tribunals that are a bridge between the international community and domestic. Uh, while Cambodia has a very mixed story for lots of reasons that have to do with its own politics, I think it's an example of that hybrid model. And I think we're going to see more of that. And that's related to a second point, which is really, in my view, the most ingenious part of the Rome statute is the notion of complementarity, that this tiny jurisdiction inability of this court in The Hague, in a corner, you know, next to Amsterdam, to be able to be the global court, is everybody knows that. So the construction, the concept is that any nation that proceeds itself with a response to crimes against humanity, to genocide, deprives this court of jurisdiction. That the act of a, another tribunal going forward means that this court doesn't even have the power. So it's an incentive structure. I think that's brilliant, and I think that's a reason why we will see new tribunals. Some may be regional. You know, the African Union, I think, is very vigorously developing a regional tribunal. That's great. That's ownership of the project of international human rights. The prosecutor, in addition, developed an idea called positive complementarity, created by some professors kicking around some ideas with the prosecutor, which is rather than passively wait 
for others to proceed? How about if the prosecutor encourages the development of the capacity in other countries, in other regions? And that's a project of the prosecutor. And that's another example of taking the weakness of the court and trying to make it a strength. And it's a chapter in the book by Chris Stone. It, correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> Good yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Juan Pablo Calderon. I am a, a fellow with the Human Rights Program, and my, my question is about the role of the OTP and the, the, the prosecutor um, broking uh, peace agreements and the fact that this is uh, widely known now, not only um, by political actors, but even by the perpetrators that would eventually be prosecuted, whether the fact that these people know that one of the objectives of the prosecutor is to be a broker would kind of make them try to think of strategies on how to shell themselves or uh, build agreements just to uh, satisfy that role as a broker of, the, of these peace agreements. Sure. So, so um, in the early years of the court, the question, I mean, I think this sort of gets to peace versus justice uh, issues, right? In the, in the early years of the court, this was a very hot issue, particularly in the context of Uganda, but some of the other conflicts as well, um, whether the court should uh, hold, stay its hand in prosecution if there was a risk that it would interfere with peace negotiations and perhaps if prosecutions would prolong the conflict. Um, and the prosecutor, um, and there is a little, there's a provision in the statute which might allow the prosecutor to take that road. It's called interest of justice consideration. And the prosecutor, and, and this is in keeping with what we've been talking about in terms of adopting policies, the prosecutor really uh, actually constrained himself and n narrowed his discretion and said, I, and took that off the table and said, I will not use that provision in the statute for that purpose. I will not consider negotiations and peace issues when I'm making prosecutorial decisions. Uh, I will, I'm a prosecutor, that's my job, I will do my job. The diplomats will have to adjust to me. I'm not going to adjust to the diplomats. Um, and I think that was a, a, a very wise course because the risk of, it, it turns out that every time there's a conflict and there are war crimes and atrocities, there are these issues about peace and negotiation. And the risk, uh, if you start to embark on those, it's, it, there's, there's no way to figure out ex ante, before, before th things have sorted themselves out, where, wh how, to, how to measure that, how to weigh it, how to consider it. There are always going to be these claims. So, um, and also, it draws the prosecutor into political conflicts and a political role. So I thought it was wise uh, for the prosecutor's mission to step away from that and tie his hands. Um, and the current prosecutor has continued that. I also think it's wise, but this is part, the, the subject of um, Bob Mnookin's chapter is that he doesn't think it's so wise. He thinks it's wiser to leave broad discretion to allow oneself to engage. But the, I believe this is one of the ways that the prosecutor sort of was able to substantiate his claim to the Security Council, at least, that he's bound by law. I, I am purely uh, applying the law, pursuing my mandate, and then I will leave it to you to deal with the diplomacy, and then I won't have to be ducking and weaving in response to every move that you make. So you have to remember, this is a brand new court, brand new office, desperate to create legitimacy. Right. And if it is perceived as picking what cases to pursue and not pursue based on political agendas, how do you build legitimacy? So uh, Luis Marino Campo has clear from the beginning, followed by the second prosecutor, they are not peace negotiators. They are not engaged in giving amnesty in exchange for promises for peace. They don't have an ability to enforce it. It would undermine the very enterprise of the court. That said, in the areas of positive complementarity, trying to build capacity, I think that's something that the, is an outlet for that concern. If you get a domestic prosecution going, then the court doesn't have to do it. Big question unanswered by the Rome Treaty is where that's something other than a prosecution deprives the court of jurisdiction. How about a truth commission? 
How about some other kind of response? And it's unanswered, and I'm writing a chapter about that for another book, if anyone wants to help me on that one. I find it hard. <laughs> um, but another way in which at least concerns about diplomacy and uh, maybe peace uh, can come into play is something else that the prosecutor invented, which is the idea of a preliminary investigation. To start an investigation in an ongoing conflict, see if that does anything. But that's it. There's no problem, and there's no possibility of negotiating peace. Um, uh, I'm Sruta Ashraf, I'm a Wasteen Fellow here, um, and I, in my normal life, work on the UN Commission of Inquiry on Syria, so it's a very kind of Syria-focused question, which feeds a little bit into what was just uh, discussed. Is I was really, I'm really interested in, in whether there's the possibility within the prosecutor's office of reframing its relationship with the Security Council just a little bit, because in the context of Syria, I understand you don't want to be a political office, although I think there is a certain sleight of hand when you say the IC prosecutor is not a political office. It's the office of the prosecutor may not be political, but the chief prosecutor does, does play a political role. And in the context of Syria, there's been a huge movement towards pursuing accountability. There's a lot of vocal, vocal criticism of the Security Council. Um, and while I'm aware that the OTP is involved in issues of accountability in Syria, it's in a very quiet way. And Office of the prosecutor. Sorry, yes. And while I'm not suggesting that they would need to criticize the Security Council, I do think there is more room to pursue a, a, more, a role of, which is more of a challenge to the Security Council and its conduct. Because the Security Council issues of accountability in Syria have become not only issues of accountability for the perpetrators, but issues of accountability of the Security Council itself. Yep. And so if you're pursuing a policy where you're saying appeasement doesn't matter, then I think having a much more passive relationship with the Security Council and much more trying to build momentum, build alliances hasn't worked. And if it was a domestic prosecutor, I would expect them to be more vocal if something as horrific as Syria was happening. Um, and I do think that there is room within the, the people who are looking at accountability for Syria, who are looking for allies, vocal allies from the ICC, that there is a movement behind them that would be as useful as an alliance as trying to massage the Security Council. Um, so I was wondering your views. Thanks for your question. Nice to see you again. <laughs> um, and I, um, so I, I, one could, I, I can't prove this in any way, but one might argue that that backlash that you're describing, which you know the General Assembly has issued um, resolutions beseeching the Council to take action on Syria, um, that that forms obviously part of the backdrop behind uh, the current prosecutor's decision to call the Security Council's bluff in December. Um, the idea that she might, uh, and, and she's also made calls for more action on Syria, in, but in sort of press releases and diplomatic circles, not directly to the Council. Um, Part of the constraints that the prosecutor's operating within are the structure and the, the sort of form of the law, which is why this sleight of hand of politics and law can hold, right, is that there is a legal structure that the prosecutor is operating within, and when she makes reports to the council, they are on the limited subjects of Libya and Sudan. That's the, that's the structure that she's operating within. So, that wouldn't be a good forum for her to become aggressive about Syria. Um, and that's, that's my thought about, about, and then you can question whether the court, what the court would do if they got Syria, right, without the resources and what, how, it, how beneficial it would be for the situation in Syria if the ICC received it right now. In fact, that's something I'm writing about right now is, is the question of whether the prosecutor should say no even if the council sent, sent her Syria. One thing just to note is the prosecutors come, of course, from many different countries, which means that they come from many different legal systems, so that their conception of the relationship between law and politics vary depending on the system that they come from. And whether a prosecutor, just to take the United States, is a prosecutor a political actor, maybe more so in the United States than in other countries. And, but the, the two prosecutors that we've had at the ICC are not from the United States. They're from traditions that are quite different. Right. And that choice to say law is binding me is very consistent with the civil law tradition and the model that, that the Rome Statute sets up, really. R right, and the, the, the prosecutor actually had quite a clear policy about this. Um, he would not, he, he would never uh, himself or allow anybody in the office to participate in any kind of lobbying for a case. 
um, any kind of you know ar arguing and going out and saying we we should get this case. You should. He he always said we cannot do that because again, once we do that, once you start lobbying for Syria, then why aren't you lobbying for for Sri Lanka? Uh, why aren't you lobbying for some other case? So he would and and the second thing he 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 would not let us work on any case that we had not yet received. So we could not do sort of anticipatory work or anything like that. Could, couldn't spend a penny on it. Um, one other thing about the resources is, it's true, of course, that the, the Security Council doesn't send resources, but the state's parties raise their own additional resources. So when cases like Libya or Sudan get assigned, the state's parties add to the budget, um, and they have a process to do that, a contingency fund, to increase the, the budget of the court to be able to handle those cases. So it becomes a question of where the money is coming from. And right. philanthropic and, sources as well. Right. Yeah. I think 60% is, England and, and France, no? Uh, Germany, Japan, Germany, Japan. Okay. yeah. Okay. Before this one last question, I'd like to remind everyone that the coop is here in the back of the room with books for sale, and we have the authors here to sign them. G great holiday presents. <laughs> great. <laughs> so, uh, 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 sorry, Jed Schwartz, Somerville. Uh, are there any circumstances, and if so, have those circumstances been tested in which uh, members of the Security Council, uh, in the event, for example, that a national of the country involved, like a national of the United States or Russia or China, was so, uh, in the process of being indicted, uh, in, in such circumstances, is it the case that that country's representative on the Security Council uh, is, is obligated to recuse themselves from exercising the veto power. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, I mean, you were talking about Syria. I mean, suppose that the such- The answer is no. Yeah. The answer is no. There, very, there is no obligation very, to, to, is no. to recuse themselves. No. no. no this, this Isn't that kind of a scandal? <laughs> the, the Security Council is a political body. But it's, I mean, not, I mean, it's, it's, it's not I mean, a judicial body, it's a political body. That's why it was built into the Rome Statute. Right. So. Right. Are there any last, do you guys, panelists, want to make any last remarks before we thank you? Um, I, I, if people are interested, please be in touch with us. Uh, this is a fascinating subject. I think that there are an uh, inexhaustible set of questions about how do you design institutions to advance justice. Um, how do you make a uh, multilateral justice institution work when the members all come from different legal systems? And whether law can make a difference in deterring gross violations of human rights. So thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you.